and talk. Welcome to Talk Story with John Wahee. We are in the middle of a very historic series of interviews. And we're going to be talking this morning with Congressman Ed Case, and he is going to tell us a little bit about where he was, what happened during the insurrection, and, the, and uh, then we'll follow up with impeachment and the aftermath. But I am so glad to get you, Congressman, on the show, knowing how busy you are, particularly at this moment uh, in time up in Washington. So aloha and a mahalo, as they say back home, so to speak. So, well, Congressman. Aloha, aloha, Governor, and to all of uh, uh, your listeners, uh, it's great to join you again. Um, as you can tell, I'm on Capitol Hill right now, and yes, it's a very, very busy time. We're trying as hard as we can to get COVID-19 emergency assistance out, uh, out to the American people, and, and uh, that's, uh, that's number one right now. That is the uh, priority, and, and I, I hope to spend some time talking a little bit about that at the end of the session, but before then, I, I want to know, where were you when the insurrection took place? I mean, what was it like? I was sitting exactly where I'm sitting right now, which is my, my office, my congressional office on Capitol Hill. Um, we have, of course, the United States Capitol itself, and then uh, very, very close to the U.S. Capitol, uh, no more than a few minutes walk, um, are three uh, house office buildings, uh, Rayburn, Longworth, and Cannon, and I was in my office in the Rayburn building, sitting where I'm sitting right now, and I was watching on the screen behind me uh, the debate uh, over certification of the election results, because of course, let's remember that that was the day that um, right. was a day under our constitution and laws for, for Congress to meet uh, to, to uh, certify the results of the election, and we knew uh, already uh, from, the, from the previous months and days and hours, uh, that that was going to be a very, very difficult day, contrary to, to the vast majority of elections throughout our history, where certification has been more pro forma than anything else, because all of the states would have already certified, as they did in this situation, uh, but we knew that this was going to be objected to. And so we were all instructed, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, to stay away from uh, 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 the chambers of the U.S. House for, for COVID-19 purposes. Uh, and, and so we were told, don't go there unless you have to speak. <clears throat> there were a limited number of our colleagues that, that were there to speak, or uh, there were a limited number of uh, uh, seats where they could watch the proceedings uh, from, from, the, uh, from, the <clears throat> from the balcony of the chamber. <clears throat> but there were no more than about 30 members uh, in the chamber total, and the rest of us so were so this was not This was the, uh, the precautions that you were taking because of COVID. 19. I mean, none of this had anything to do with the, the rally that former no, President Trump was all. holding. Not at all. Um, and, and in the normal course in a non-COVID-19 environment, I would have been there and I would have wanted to be there for such, for such a uh, critical uh, a series of votes. And I, want, I would have wanted to be there to, to participate in the debate personally. But the fact of the matter was most of us were not. So I was sitting in my office. I was watching uh, the debate, and uh, there came a time where uh, the debate was obviously heated. We obviously knew that uh, there were there were many protesters around the Capitol. I had uh, they they had been there since the previous night. Uh, we had had votes that night, and I had walked out uh, from uh, outside from from the U.S. Capitol back to my office and stopped to talk to some of the folks that were starting to gather. So, you know, clearly we knew it was a difficult day to start with. Uh, we didn't know that this was going to be the outcome of it, uh, but. But for me uh, personally, um, I, um, I was watching the proceedings and there came a point at which I could tell that something was wrong just because I know what the rhythms of the house are. And I could tell from watching that, that TV that, that something had disrupted the house. At first, I thought it was uh, perhaps some protesters up in the, up in the balcony and the visitors uh, gallery um, you know, yelling or something like that until I realized there, there were no such people in the gallery. Um, wow. Something else was happening. And so you became aware of this, uh, what, watching television. Or when did you really get a sense that the Capitol was under siege? Well, a couple of things happened very, very quickly. First of all, I saw what was happening on TV, and then the feed went uh, blank, uh, which was highly unusual. At that moment, uh, my personal device, because we are all connected uh, to security uh, through, through um, you know, 
a very uh, specific personal network to alert us to emergencies. And my 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 emergency assistance, uh, you know, um, system went off, and it, the uh, the message was, you know, capital, um, you know, capital. I forget exactly what it was, but the capital is under assault. Um, stay in your office, shelter in place, uh, lock your doors, turn off your lights so that nobody knows that you're in your office and be quiet. Did, did you have staff in your office with you that morning? I had, I'm... I had some members of my staff because um, my chief of staff was, was with me here. And I had a couple of brand new members uh, who were appropriately you know, spaced out for, for COVID-19 uh, purposes. So we were taking the precautions, but they were here. Um, and they had just started like two to three days before that. So. <laughs> what an experience to walk into as a new staffer, you know? I mean, you I go there thinking. The fact, uh, well, yes, I mean, I, and an unfortunate experience, but none, but but uh, clearly a a a a um, a very disturbing moment in our history. But they were witness to it because um, we did then shelter in place uh, for um, six hours. Uh, and and then of course, oh. uh, so after after I um, after I got that alert, uh, I turned on the, the TV to the regular stations, and they showed the Capitol under siege. Uh, so I I knew pretty clearly that that was happening, although I did not at the time know the extent of it, um, and I certainly didn't understand the severity of it in terms of loss of life and and serious injury. Now you were in the, which building at the next to the state capitol? You're in the Rayburn. I'm in the Rayburn uh, building, and boy, and they must have been so. The Rayburn building, it's there were so many people involved in uh, that whole incident that they 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 sh actually, from what little I know about Washington, it would seem that even the Rayburn building must have had people right out of, outside of it. Well, the well, very the, close the, by to it. Well, you know, the, first of all, the focus of the assault was the U.S. Capitol itself. However. Uh, from all reports, um, uh, uh, some of the folks that assaulted the Capitol had uh, quite detailed maps of the Capitol to include uh, the underground tunnel that leads from the Capitol directly to the Rayburn building. So I can walk from where I'm sitting through a tunnel under underground to the floor of the U.S. Capitol in about four minutes. And so that means they could have basically run down the same tunnel and arrived at the Rayburn building. And in fact, that the Capitol Police was was rightly concerned that that um, that would be what they would do. It didn't turn out to be what happened. Also, we, uh, at the same time, uh, be before the actual assault, um, there were two, as I recall, alerts on my phone uh, of uh, suspicious objects in the grounds around the Capitol. So right outside the Rayburn and, and Cannon and uh, Longworth buildings. And in fact, as it turned out, one of them was a false alarm, but one of them was not a false alarm. It was a pipe bomb. Uh, that had been wow. had been left, um, um, you know, uh, within um, you know, 75 yards of the entrance to the Cannon Building. So uh, it was, uh, you know, I, now I had nothing like the experience my colleagues did, uh, or that for that matter, you know, thousands of Capitol Police and National Guard troops, et cetera, that were actually defending the Capitol, and, and you know, a number of my colleagues were in the Capitol. Um, at the time, and the U.S. Senate was in session. They chose uh, to, uh, for the most part, um, because they can distance a little bit more in their chamber, but they were in personal session. So um, the, the consequences and risk to uh, those that were in the Senate chamber was far broader than in the House chamber. Nonetheless, uh, you know, to listen to, to, to my colleagues um, talk about uh, their own experiences uh, during the attack uh, was... Um, they legitimately felt that they were in danger of up to and in, including lose, losing their life. And so um, there's no reason to doubt that uh, it could have happened under different circumstances. Wow, that's that's what an incredible experience. Now, you know, we, we move on from from that day and it triggers a second impeachment of the former president. And um, tell us a little bit of what it was like to go through that experience first in uh, formulating the articles of impeachment and watching the trial being presented by your colleagues. Well, um, the charge, of course, let's let's remember that um, in impeachment, that the, the job of the United States House is to charge. 
the job of the United States House is not to decide, uh, but to but to charge. And so our job was to evaluate the evidence that we had and decide whether to charge uh, the president uh, 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 by passage of articles of, of impeachment. Uh, with a um, crime uh, uh, that justified uh, removal from office or could justify removal from office. And when I use the word crime, uh, one thing that um, I want to be very clear on is that although there are there are analogies uh, to an actual criminal offense, uh, um, as most people understand it, that's not what our job is. Our job is to decide whether the president violated his oath of office uh, in such a way as, as, as to justify removal from office. And so that's the context for crime in this situation. Uh, and so um, it was, you know, um, it was necessary, I believe, for us to enter into the deliberation over whether to actually pass um, articles of impeachment. Um, the decision that we made very early on, which I thought was the correct decision, was to focus very narrowly on the exact um, uh, um, attack on the Capitol and the linkage uh, from that attack to the actions of the president in order to determine whether, in fact, uh, the president, uh, in our view, the president uh, had incited uh, the violence that then resulted in the attack on the Capitol and had conducted himself in a way as to violate his oath of office. And that was the actual article of impeachment uh, that we evaluated um, and eventually passed. And I, and I voted for that because I felt that that charge was entirely justified under the facts. You know, as a, as a lawyer, <laughs> as a lawyer, you must have been, at least I was, uh, impressed by the case that the, the House of Representatives made in the actual trial itself. Uh, you know, I know that there are different standards uh, for impeachment as they might be um, in the court of law in the sense that you are looking at things from a different uh, perspective in a way. But I felt that uh, the House managers did a job that in the court of law would have uh, rendered a positive verdict. I mean, I don't, are you got any thoughts about the case that was presented to the state Senate? Well, I, I believe um, that had the president actually been charged in a court of law with incitement to violence, uh, using the standards that are applied uh, to um, evaluate um, whether incitement to violence had actually occurred, and you, and you know this also as a lawyer that you go through a couple of steps. Uh, did the president uh, say something that could incite violence? Was there a connection between uh, the statement that he made and the actual um, occurrence uh, of, of what happened? Uh, these are the basic elements of, of incitement to violence in a criminal uh, case in the court of law. And I believe uh, that our charge was appropriate so that if a prosecutor had made the same charge on the same facts, it would have been entirely appropriate. Um, and I believe um, that a jury, having listened to the case on both sides, uh, may well have found uh, President Trump um, uh, guilty of incitement to violence. Uh, it was entirely plausible. That was, again, was not the standard that we applied because our standard is, have you violated your oath of office, which is to protect the constitution, protect the dem democratic process and protect your, your fellow citizens. Uh, and, and, and I felt that he violated um, that basic fundamental oath of office, but it's, but it's analogous again to, to a criminal prosecution. And I thought, I agree with you. I think the house managers laid out a very deliberate case. I didn't think that the the defense was, uh, first of all, I don't buy the defense at all that um, it's unconstitutional to, to impeach a former president because otherwise you just give a president carte blanche to do whatever he or she wants in the closing you know, months of a presidency. I don't think that's what the founders um, um, anticipated. Uh, and then on the facts, um, I, don't think they, I don't think they effectively you know, disputed the, the connection between what the president did and, and the assessment of his motives, which is part of this. Did that right. actually intend that result? And I think, I think we have to conclude that the president at least knew it was a possibility. Um, and even knowing it was a possibility, from my perspective, 
uh, justified impeachment. Well, we're going to take a short break and then uh, come back to this very interesting conversation. Uh, I want to talk to you about a little bit about about the uh, um, the, the the Senate's participation in all of this and and, and what happened. But I, I think uh, right now we're going to take a one minute break and we'll be right back, Congressman. Thank you so much for your insight. Welcome back. We are here talking story with Congressman Ed Case, and he is he is laying the foundation for for our study of American history, frankly, and learning a lot about what happened uh, at the state capitol during the insurrection and the impeachment. Now, Ed, you, you made uh, Congressman, you made your your case uh, as the House, and that went before the Senate. What do you have any thoughts about the way the Senate conducted its trial or? Well, um, again, I think, I think that the, the House managers and the, these are the representatives of the House uh, in, in, um, in effectively being the prosecutors of the president um, in, in the US Senate, which again has the duty to he actually hear the charge and decide what to do with it. I think they did a great job of laying out the facts uh, they did not lay out, uh, I didn't think, a political case. They laid out um, the facts. Uh, they laid out what happened and when and why uh, the charge uh, was justified in terms of causal connection uh, between the actions of the president and the assault on the Capitol, uh, which was, uh, uh, you know, what the president did was fairly straightforward and what the crowd did was uh, a very, very straightforward. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I got to say this, though. It, it seemed like, um, on one hand, things were done very factually, but it was also done in a very political context. I mean, you can't get away from the fact that ultimately the, um, the impeachment process is about politics. I mean, well... The impeachment process is the accountability of a president of the United States to his or her uh, fellow citizens uh, through the mechanism um, under the U.S. Constitution. And um, there is nothing in the U.S. Constitution that limits uh, that inquiry to, to purely violations of criminal law or, for that matter, to um, uh, so-called politics. And so, um, yes, uh, there was some element of politics and some legal scholars uh, going back, you know, to the founding fathers have always uh, said that uh, that impeachment um, is a is a is a political response by which they don't mean politics as we know it, but no. by which they mean the accountability of a president to Congress and to the American people through Congress. And so in that sense, uh, there was a broader uh, sense of accountability that was at the at the heart of the question um, in, in, the, in, the, in the US Senate. Um, and, um, you know, the impeachment managers put on their case and, and the president's uh, defense team put on its case. Uh, but I think we can all, you know. You know, I, I, I want to thank you for clarifying that because sometimes we use the word politics or political a little too loosely. And, uh, you know, and there was some tones of partisanship, uh, but, Really, it was the impeachment itself 
is about political accountability, as you just so eloquently uh, expressed. Right. Now, right. And now, of course, um, and of course, um, of course, of course, there were political uh, ramifications to the, to the to the debate that went well beyond the, the assault on the Capitol. It was not the basis of my decision um, to to impeach him, <clears throat> but you know, I can't speak for all of my colleagues, and and certainly. And certainly, the broader picture of uh, of, the, of the Trump presidency was was part of that debate in one way, shape, or form, and accountability for it, for that matter. Um, but at the end of the day, as we uh, know, um, it was not a partisan vote. In fact, it was the least partisan vote ever uh, uh, for any uh, impeachment, um, and it came closer, uh, really, on a on a nonpartisan basis uh, to to actual conviction. Uh, than any of the other situations that we've uh, dealt with impeachment. Uh, you know, the, the first impeachment of President Trump, uh, with with one exception, was a was a purely partisan uh, vote. This one wasn't. Um, you had a number of uh, Republicans who felt that there was uh, a violation of, of President Trump's oath of office, uh, and so uh, you can't wrap this up and call it, uh, you know. Your part of, uh, no, I'm glad I, I'm glad you're bringing that out because it showed it underscores the idea of the merit of the merits of the underlying case that you would in a divided uh, environment still have people acting in a nonpartisan way on the facts and. So it, it also underscores in my mind because there's a there's a kind of some of the political fallout uh, has to do with the fact that uh, the pre former president now is, is going around um, basically claiming vindication that somehow not reaching two thirds vote is a vindication of his actions when. You know, in my opinion, the fact that you had a nonpartisan response kind of undercuts that all that argument. Anyway, um, so that happened. Okay, we went to the trial. We went through. What happens now? I mean, is there any fallout uh, for any of this? Uh, Oh yes, I mean, uh, well, clearly, uh, clearly the the clearly the the impeachment, uh, second impeachment, um, has amplified um, divisions within the Republican Party itself. Uh, and so, um, if I could say, you know, one of the principal areas of fallout is um, what direction will the Republican Party uh, go now? Um, it has been one of our two major parties for a long, long time. Um, it clearly still has uh, a, a major role in our country, uh, you know, given uh, given a number of factors, uh, um, the, the switches in uh, the majorities in the House and the Senate over the last 20 years, and in the presidency for that matter. But the Republican Party has kind of a day of reckoning right now, which is, you know, which way are we going to, which way are we going to go? Are we going to be the party that sanctions uh, the behavior of of uh, President, uh, you know, Trump, or and or is is un, is unwilling politically, and I make that uh, that I use that word in the, the political sense of politically unwilling to depart from him, unwilling to take the risk, unwilling to stand on principle to say that um, that uh, um, you know his his conduct is not acceptable, and and there's a different place for our party, or is it the other side of the Republican Party, which? You know whether you agree with it or not um, is kind of back to the principles of, of conservatism under Ronald Reagan and you know George, uh, you know um, H. W. Bush uh, and and really before we got into a, a Republican Party that started to 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 um, you know divert into you know other other approaches. And by the way, yeah. I'm not including my own party because I think my own party has uh, many of the same questions uh, to face, but not in the context of of a former leader like Trump, not in the crystallized context of, of, of are you the party of Trump or are you the party of the, of, 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 of Lincoln, people, uh, of the yeah. party of Lincoln or of the people, but with a conservative uh, viewpoint? There's, well, you, you know, the uh, when I was active, involved with issues and things uh, on the Congress, you know, 
we, the, the, the leadership of the uh, Senate, for example, was uh, George Mitchell or uh, uh, Bob Dole. But, and both, out, in my opinion, outstanding gentlemen. I mean, you, you couldn't, uh, you know, and, and, and they ended up both being my law partners at, at one time. So we used to sit around and talk politics. But there was this feeling that uh, no matter where you are on the, from the center line, that the uh, interest at stake was the country. I, you know, I don't know whether we have moved on from something like that to something more like uh, what was the interest at stake might be some kind of a cultural divide. I mean, people just don't see the same America anymore. Well, I mean, um, we have moved on, but the question is whether there's enough of, of what was, uh, which I thought was um, uh, far preferable from the perspective of, of the president and future of our country, and whether we can get back to that. So is this kind of more of a, of a permanent divide? I don't believe so. I, I can't believe so. I can't, I, personally, I can't accept the, the, the notion of a permanently divided uh, country. And let me, let me also uh, observe that, uh, that in, in, for example, just take, take Hawaii as an example, um, <clears throat> and my own district for that matter. One third plus, of the voters of Hawaii and of my district voted for President Trump just a few months ago. And I, right. I, have to, I have to represent them as I represent the people that did not vote for President Trump. And so, uh, you know, my responsibility is, is to my district and to my constituents. And of course I have to make my judgments uh, based on my own, you know, uh, uh, perspectives and guidance from my constituents. Uh, but that doesn't mean I walk away from, from one third plus of my own constituents. And I, neither can I say that our country can walk away from one half of our fellow citizens uh, because of a, a disagreement. I, I can't accept that result. And I would, I would go back also uh, to your question, what happens now and observe that we're not to the bottom of what actually happened on January 6th. Uh, there are ongoing investigations, including by the, by the FBI on large scale uh, to determine some of the basic questions that are still uh, outstanding, for example, to what degree um, was this a coordinated attack and who actually coordinated it. And so there may well be um, uh, major um, developments as we, as we get through that evaluation. You know, I read an article recently that talked about America in general and what the article, the point of the article was, the, uh, was saying that uh, we know what evil looks like, Hitler and, you know, Stalin and the rest. What we don't know in America right now uh, is what's good. That we, a lot of our debate on policy centers on people who are culturally divided on the definition of what is good. And do you see any way that that kind of drift can be overcome because I, I agree with you. I think, you know, I long, I remember what it was like to be able to, you know, go across the aisle and talk to an Everett Dirksen or talk to somebody or talk to Bob Dole about uh, the country as a Democrat and persuade him to uh, see Hawaii's point of view. And uh, yeah, and I don't know whether that's even possible anymore. Well, I would, I would say this back to you on that. First of all, I, I think we all know inside ourselves what looks like good for our country. Um, I think we all know and believe that um, we should try to work together as one country. We may have uh, great disagreements and we may feel very, very divided and polarized, but I think we all understand uh, that at the end of the day, we are still all Americans and we owe it to each other to try to work through our differences. So I think that's good. And I think most of us recognize that good. I would also say that you, may, you started out by saying we don't, we, we can see what evil is. And I will tell you that in the course of, of history, uh, many times people did not see evil as it was approaching them. They only saw it when it was upon them and or when it was too late. Um, right. You, you made course. reference to, to, to Germany under Hitler. Germany democratically elected Adolf Hitler um, uh, before he, before, before they saw true evil. 
and and so you know before he stormed the capital in germany and took the the problem exactly you know he 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 burned down the Reichstag. Yeah. um and so um and so i think that we can never be uh, uh too vigilant um and i think that um although some people discount it um when we when we just look the other way, when the citadel of our democracy, the, 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 the living representation of our democracy is assaulted uh, by fellow citizens with, I believe, the incitement of the president of the United States, that's something that you better pay attention to because uh, from, them, from there, it can get a lot worse very, very fast until pretty soon, um, you know, pretty soon you're into the, the true, true um, evil phase. Thank you so much for all that, uh, you know, all the, that uh, your participation this morning. But I, I got a few minutes, we started running over, but I do want uh, you to tell the people of Hawaii a little bit about what you're doing in Congress in terms of your committee assignments, how did that all works for Hawaii and the rest of it, if you don't mind. Sure, no, thank you very much. Well, you know, first of all, I just took uh, in early January my fifth oath of office in, in Congress. Uh, and so wow. you know, I'm starting to um, starting to have some mileage up here. Uh, <laughs> and, and, I, and I hope that that, that seniority is, is being used for the benefit, uh, not only of our country, but especially for Hawaii. So, so the committees that I'm on here are very good committees for Hawaii. So the, the, the main committee that I'm on here is the Appropriations Committee, which is which is the oldest committee in the United States Congress, the House Appropriations Committee, and is the committee responsible for allocating and dividing up and sending out federal funding. Uh, That's and so very important. It's very, a very important, important committee. committee. Very important committee. Uh, I was uh, very, very you know, privileged and lucky to get on it <clears throat> in my last uh, uh, time in Congress. And uh, so I've tried to use that committee uh, to the maximum on behalf of Hawaii to take care of many, many needs. And by the way, it's not all about just you know money. Um, the Appropriations Committee gives you a great deal of ability to, to influence the direction of, of federal departments and, and of Congress itself in areas that help Hawaii in a non-money way. So that's number one. Uh, number two, I'm a member again this uh, time of, of the Committee on Natural Resources, which um, has jurisdiction over all of our public lands including national parks, et cetera, et cetera, um, which is very important in Hawaii. It also has jurisdiction of all of our oceans, which is critical to us. And I take a personal interest in our oceans being from the ocean, if I can put it that way. And then finally, <laughs> that committee has jurisdiction over native Hawaiians. Uh, and so there's a critical nexus uh, to Hawaii uh, through that committee. And so those are my two committees. Uh, of course, I work with my uh, fellow delegation members, Senators Hirono and Schatz, and, and now Representative Kaheli, uh, who also have very, very good committees. And so our challenge as a delegation um, is to exert uh, the positions and influence that we have, which is one of the best uh, collective positions and influences in a generation plus uh, for, for the Hawaii congressional delegation uh, to the benefit of Hawaii. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning here. The I guess it's early afternoon in Washington. Um, you got any last words for uh, pe for people in Hawaii? Uh, when are well, we going to see some COVID relief or whatever? You know, we're, well, uh, we're 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 still seeing COVID relief from especially from the nine hundred billion dollar bill that we passed in December. That's still coming into Hawaii and in the billions of dollars. Uh, but the one that we're working on right now is the next big one. The 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 one point nine trillion dollar American Rescue Plan proposed by President Biden and. I'm very much hoping and believing that we will pass that by mid-March and that we will start to see the results uh, pretty much immediately. And, oh. and as, a, as a final closing item, um, uh, I welcome anybody to contact me or to check me out through case.house.gov. So if you have any comments on this show or anything else, we can help you out with anything, just contact us at case.house.gov. Mahalo, Congressman. We, we, I really appreciate your thinking time from your very busy schedule to participate in our uh, show. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you very much for doing this. Aloha.